Bible tells us to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. It also says for us to fight the good fight of the faith. We are to stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. We fight against demonic principalities. We fight against doctrines of demons. We pull down strongholds. We stand against the false prophet. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We stand on Christ. We stand on truth. We are armored up and ready to contend and fight the enemy. Contending for the faith. <laughs> is literally preparing his people for something that doesn't look like what was. And for the last few weeks, months, I've uh, lost track. We've been talking about the spirit of religion. And we've been talking about uh, all that goes on with Babylon. And we've been talking about a little bit about Jezebel, not a whole lot. But we've been talking about a whole lot of stuff. Uh, that we even heard about tonight that has gone on in church in the name of God because we have connected to the spirit of religion and eradicated uh, true faith and eradicated uh, the necessity of relationship with Jesus Christ. It's essential as believers that we find ourselves um we find ourselves at the throne of God. It's essential. And I believe that in this hour, even for me, and I believe for many from testimony, God is is kind of rattling uh, our normalcy so that we might get to his effective glory. Amen. That we might get beyond buildings and prestige and what people think of us and positions and all the things that make up religion and get us into relationship so that we can see the power of God manifested among us in truth and in literal manifestation. I believe that we're getting ready to experience some things uh, where it may run people into house churches in the first place because the, any day they can make a law and say that we can't gather together anymore in such crowds of 200 or more and things of that nature. Um, and anyway, there's more intimacy in those type of groups in our reality. Uh, but just hold your head up and know, as the Bible says for us to do, I want to encourage you or exhort you as we're seeing the day of the Lord draw near. It's coming nigh. It's coming soon, sooner than later to hold on to God's hand, hold on to his grace, hold on to revelation and make sure that you are in right relationship with the father. Make sure that you have an ear to hear and that you're not just looking for um, someone to uh, be between you and God, if you would, uh, but to literally seek after God for yourselves. And so last week we left off talking about uh, cosmos or talking about the different uh, hierarchies of Satan as it relates to uh, Babylon and it relates to the spirit of religion understanding that the spirit of religion or Baal worship, Babylon, all of those things, um, mythological gods and all those type of things are aligned with that same religious method in which Satan established uh, from the garden to present. And uh, we won't get into it so much tonight. We've touched on how we see his religious methods uh, functioning uh, today. Amen. And so as we were talking about cosmos, we talked about the fact that the New Testament Greek word uh, translated world is com cosmos and cosmos does not refer to the physical planet Earth for that. The Greek word is geos, uh, nor to periods of world history for that. The Greek word is aeon. Rather, it has the basic meaning of an organization or a hierarchical structure of intelligent beings to control and to run something. Cosmos in the New Testament refer to the full organization of Satan. 
who brought through his powers and principalities a hierarchy of fallen angel spirits down to individual demons has extensive influence over mankind on earth with actual near total control over people in many cases thus while the world the bible says to be not conformed to this cosmos or to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind and as we've said each and every week there's only two laws there's the law of the spirit and there's the law of sin and death when we function uh, from the influence of the enemy or the flesh we are operating out of the law of sin and death but when we follow out the spirit, I'm just telling you in a different form, Romans chapter eight, when we follow after the Holy Spirit, the law of the spirit or the spirit of God, and we're functioning in the order in which God has called man to function. And when we don't understand that it's only two entities or two spirits or two laws in which man can live by or man lives by, then we really can't understand struggles within our own selves. Because when we have struggles in our flesh, the bottom line is, is that we haven't yielded uh, to, to the Holy Spirit in that particular area, or we lack revelation knowledge that will bring us out of those scenarios and those situations. This is why it's very important to walk with God in a position that allows him to be able to speak to us because as believers, we are to have revelation. God wants to impart his wisdom. God wants to impart his messages. He wants to impart uh, his will. He wants to impart knowledge unto his people for the word says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And so God is all about revealing the things uh, of the kingdom of God and as well as spiritual warfare strategies, which is a shame a lot of people don't comprehend and understand. Why? Because that same book in chapter talks about the fact that men have held the truths of God away from the people. And this is why they uh, perish for a lack of knowledge. And so we talked about that last week and we got real heavy into Ephesians chapter six and all that. And we ran out of time and I'm not going to uh, jump back into that. But what I do want to talk about is Satan's methods. You have to understand Satan has not changed. Lucifer has not changed anything. His whole overall goal is to establish his throne above God. Uh, cause man's souls to look unto him, which he uses as a mirror, because most of the time when we do things contrary to God, it's not necessary that Satan is influencing us or making us. He has caused us uh, or influenced us to think of ourselves, to worship ourselves. So when um, we cheat in our marriages, it's generally driven by ego, lust, and self-pride and the need to um, uh, have our ego stroke or fed so that we feel like we're more than what we are. And, it, and let's, let's face it, many people have even started churches because we want to uh, have an uh, a outlet or a way for people to, to worship us, look up to us, make us feel like we're more than, than we, we really feel that we are. There's a lot of people in the pulpit with low self-esteem. Let's just, let's just point out, say it. And people have not had an encounter with Jesus Christ to tell them to even do what they're doing. We go about doing good deeds to hope that God blesses it because in our minds it's good. But the Bible says clearly, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. The Bible tells us to be obedient. He also said that obedience is better than sacrifice. And in that particular text, King Saul thought that he was doing God a favor. He felt that he was doing what God would want him to do. And it seemed like the right thing to do, but it's not what God told him to do. And like my spiritual mother tell me all the time, you got to do what God is telling you to do. What is Jesus saying to you? 
and be obedient to that. And what God says to you, child of God, may not be what they said, what God said to the people down the street. It may not look like the people around the corner. It may not be in the order or, or the tradition of men, but you have to do what God has called you to do because when you do what God has called you to do, then you will be effective and then you will be doing what God has, has called you to do and then you'll begin to get God results. Amen. So Satan's most effective method of seducing men and women to yield to his control over them is via a religious system. And we saw that throughout our study. We've seen that throughout the Old Testament uh, when Israel would fall into bow worship and things of that nature. He used a religious system. Indeed, that come closest to his overall goal. And so, again, Satan doesn't mind you doing religious things. He doesn't mind you being religious. And I want to point out the fact that we in this teaching, we talked about what true religion is to God. And the one thing about true religion versus religion, true religion is about serving other people. True religion is about uh, other people. It's not about you. Amen. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's about it's about being the hand of God, being the mouthpiece of God, being uh, dutiful to God in serving him and his people. That's what true religion is, according to James chapter 1 and uh, Isaiah over there, I believe it's 56, and, and things of that nature. What Satan's religion does is focus on you. Satan's religion focuses on you, what you do to produce what you feel like you need to have on a spiritual quote unquote level. Um, and he uses all of this falseness to make you think that you're getting closer to God when you could be doing religious activity and so far from God. We just heard it. It's not the first time. It won't be the last time. In fact, as my spiritual mother told me today, People, pre preachers will continue to sin. Preachers will continue to uh, chase after their flesh and things of that nature because that's where they are. Until they get revelation to come out, that's where they are, bound by their flesh. Amen. And so we're, we're not, we're not going to harp on that. But what we want to point out is that the religious system of Satan will always be about you, your ego, your position, your possession, who you think you are, who you want to be, and who you demand people to believe you are. Amen. Amen. And so uh, his seduction first leads us to be or to, come, or, or to become a part uh, or come apart from a walk in faith in the true God. Let me say that again as I stumbled all over that. His seduction first leads us to be or come apart from a walking faith in the true God. When we start putting all of this mythological ideologies of God, meaning that you got a God who's going to provide rain, you got a God who's going to provide money, you got a God who's going to provide you your lust. Do you hear what I'm saying? People absolutely function like this. There's pastors on the line, and I'm sure you've heard people say uh, that, that God told them that X, Y, Z was their, their mate and things of that nature. And they're not even dating or they don't know each other like that. Uh, people <laughs> have fantasies about people and, and believe that that's what God wants for them. Even though the man is married or the woman is married, all these things happen right in church. And what we have to understand is this is very pagan. This is this is right from the bow worship. This is the very method or the religious system in, uh, that the enemy has um, strategized over throughout history. But the whole point is to walk uh, to walk from true faith in God, from the true God, understanding who God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is, the God of creation, the God of Israel. We need to understand who he is from the perspective of how he reveals himself and not ideals, traditions of men and getting mythological gods mixed in with God, uh, or Ye, or Yah, the God who has created all of us, we walk away from true relationship. We walk away from true faith. And that's a whole subject in itself. This seduction is via our fallen nature as Satan exploits our vulnerability to the three categories of temptation in the garden in Genesis 3 and 6, and of the wilderness 
uh, that Jesus dealt with in Matthew 4, 3 through 10, and Luke 4, 1 through 13. One, the flesh. Let's talk about this. Materialism. Shall we go any further? Because the focus of a lot of churches right now is materialism. We have to have the best looking building because that's going to say that God is good to us and that we are blessed. Huh? Do you hear what I'm saying? In fact, I'm going to tell you what, getting the right building can absolutely catapult your ministry to the next religious level in that everybody will know who you are and it begins to stroke your ego now Antoine Rawson is speaking from uh, experience when we moved into a building that was 25,000 square feet everybody knew my name everybody knew my church um, people I didn't know had did extensive background on who we were because we got into this building. So I know what I'm talking about. Materialism, what you drive, what you have, you supposed to be blessed. You supposed to have the best. If the dope dealers can have it, the children of God can have it. X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. But don't you understand that goes right directly against what the word of God says? Do not coven another man's property, things, wife, and etc. All those kind of things. So we shouldn't even be pumping that. That shouldn't even be the focus. How does material drive us to God? It doesn't. The Bible says over in Matthew chapter 6 that you can't serve God and money. But the Bible also says the money serveth a, a, a purpose. So we got to understand balance. But when we focus on materialism, when we shout every week over what God is going to give us, when we believe God only for what he's going to give us, when we uh, expect from God, only what he can give us then we're missing God we're functioning out of the flesh now the truth be it known is that God is in the midst of your worst situation and I believe that's why God permits or drive us or allow us just as he did to Jesus drove him into the wilderness to be tempted that he drives us into places of whatever you would call drought or whatever so that we might experience him and know that it doesn't matter what your status is like i was talking to my cousin today and we was talking about that factor people are chasing status and even when you achieve status people are still unhappy because it's an empty chase you you can't be fulfilled by having material you can have a three hundred thousand dollar house but when you lose it what do you have you can be anna nicole and be the richest woman on the planet but when she lost her son and she lost her her sanity if you would she couldn't handle it and she killed herself she's not the only one ladies and gentlemen People are chasing what people kill themselves over and things of that nature. So so the flesh, materialism, physical security, the focus on being secure. This one man has over a hundred thousand dollars in 16 bank accounts. Saw this on Ricky Lake. Over a hundred thousand dollars, and he has no furniture in his house. He will only permit his his family to have mattresses that they put on the on the floor and sleep on, and they eat at a card table with folding tables. He has over a hundred thousand dollars. Now, what came to mind is exactly that. Uh, Matthew chapter six: Store, do not store up yourself uh, treasures in the earth that can rot and be stolen and all that kind of stuff, but instead store up for yourself treasures in heaven which a thief cannot steal etc etc and so when we operate from the flesh we're looking at materialism physical security fleshly appetites economic financial sexual uh, uh ego all of those things emotional you see some people can't uh, don't believe that they have experienced God if they do not have an emotional climax or emotional experience that does not determine whether you have experienced God or not if you go to the right comedy club you will feel emotions if you go to the right concert you will feel emotions if you uh, listen to the right music you will feel emotion if you read the right book magazine post or whatever else you can feel emotions emotions do not dictate or determine the fact of God being in the room but the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty and that's not liberty to sin and that's not just this freedom liberty in your spirit but it it is a liberty to go to the throne room of God. It's the liberty to have ears to hear what God is speaking to his church, what God is speaking to you as his church, as his people, a liberty to go into the throne room.
room and pray and seek the face of God because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. Glory be to God. That's what the liberty is. When the presence of God is there in your churches, one manifestation should be repentance. When God's presence come in throughout the Bible, you see where mankind begin to repent. When the word is going forth, it ought to draw people closer to God. It ought to cause people to reflect on where they are, to seek God, to repent, and to ask God for forgiveness. You ought to see the manifestation of his power if there is necessary, if there is a necessity of of healing, if there's a necessity of reconciliation, if there's a necessity of demons being cast out, the word or his presence to bring and cause wickedness to manifest. Hallelujah. All of these type of things is not about your emotion. It's not about how people can fish flip-flop on the floor. It's not about how people run around church. It's not about a tongue even. It's not about an emotional welling. It's not about tears. It's about what do you walk away from his presence and know? Because when God reveals himself, when God revealed himself, everybody walked away knowing something different. Everybody walked away with some revelation. Everybody had tapped in to his glory, to his revelation, to his grace. And, and it came out a different person. And so you can't fool me just because you know how to do church or religious things. You don't fool me when your life says otherwise. Because when you've been in the presence of God, there's no way you come out the same. No way. No way you come out the same. And so from that, we look at the soul. Freedom from domination by other people. Uh, uh, you know, we don't want to be dominated. The soul, the, the soulish realm. Freedom from domination by other people. Intellectual domination over other people. Social or political manipulation of other people. Military power, political military. And even not being under the domination or the influence of God, the Holy Spirit himself. Because when you think from the aspect that I do what I want to do, what you say is, I am the Lord of my life. And really what you're saying is, Satan, I give you permission to control me, to influence me. Do you hear what I'm saying? When we put God on the throne, this is what Jesus said. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, which has everything to do with death, a burden, and then he's able to follow me. Paul told us, Saul, Paul told us that we must die daily. And so that Jesus taught us to pray, not my will, but thy will be done. So our soulish realm is submitted to God. Our intellect, our, our ability, our will, our ability to think and reason and all of that is submitted to God that God might have dominion, that he might have influence, that he might have dominion rule that he might have a throne room on the heart of our soul or the or, or the throne of our soulless realm and third spirit aesthetic beauty philosophy religious philosophical our spirit being the physical beauty philosophy the ability to philosophy and things of that nature that's what satan is after our spirit man our spirit man is what he is literally after because that's what belongs to god that's why every man according to scripture has knowledge of god has an understanding of something why because that's where you came from and it's like i use the analogy of children who have been adopted uh, there becomes an inherent thing in them when they realize there's something different between me and them i've heard stories of people uh growing up with families ending up in drugs and alcohol addiction and things of that nature and not understanding why they are in that particular predicament until they find out that they've been adopted that their parents were addicts and things of that nature and so there's something about your inherent nature that longs for where its source came from, that nature or that spirit. It is a is a, a, a connection or a desire to know from whence it came. It came from God. For the scripture says that God breathed unto the nostrils of men and he became a living soul or spirit. And so... Um, 
We have to understand that Satan is a deceiver. He is a liar. Jesus said that he is the father of lies. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, and the huge dragon was cast down and out. That age old serpent who is called the devil and Satan, who is who is the seducer, deceiver of all humanity the world over. He was forced out and down to the earth and his angels were flung out along with him. The spirit of religion draws on emotional ties or spells to hold people in bondage. Do you hear what I'm saying? And that's all spells are. They are they are spells, they are witchcraft, they are lies, potions, things of that nature. And a religion draws on the emotional ties or spells to hold people in bondage. This is why we do a lot of chanting. <laughs> this is why... We use loud music to rev up the emotionalism of the people. I'm talking somebody. This is why we do this. And I take note that we get the loudest right before offering time. You, you put up the choir. You put up your best singer or whatever right before offering time because you get the people in the emotions and you can hold them in bondage. Listen, why do you think it is that people know they're not being spiritually fed, that they are spiritually dying, but they stay at churches that are not feeding them? It's because they are under emotional ties and spells. Ask them why they can't leave. Well, uh, nine times out of ten, they'll tell you something like, well, I've gone there all of my life. That's an emotional tie. They'll tell you that my family was gone there ever since my great-grandpa or my grandpa. Two, that was my daddy's church, my papa's church, my uncle's church, my family church. Three, and four, they'll tell you stuff like, I don't even really know. And then when you find out that pastors... Uh, uh, some of these pastors are sleeping with these women and that's why they can't break. It's called a soul tie. That's a spell too in itself. Or that the fact that they have their ears and they have their hearts and, and their emotions are all wrapped up into this church. They can't function. You ask them to, to, to go to church or go somewhere else or vacation on a Sunday away from their church. They almost literally lose their rabbit minds because they are so emotionally and tied and entangled with this church. The church almost replaces God. In fact, it does because in the, in many cases, people are more loyal to their membership of their church than they are to their loyalty to the king or the Lord of their supposed to be lives. Amen. And so we understand that the Lord means that he has rule. Lordship means he has rule. And I want to point out that the Bible doesn't say that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Savior or that he is Jesus or Yeshua. The Bible says that every knee and tongue will confess that he is Lord. So so he has a dominion. He has a, a, a government. He has a law. He has an authority that is above any other man or any other authority in the earth realm. That's what we have to recognize. And so people are, are caught up into this because we allow the deceiver to deceive us. Jesus said, Jesus said that, uh, that many would be deceived, even the elect, if it was possible. So what's the difference between many and the elect? The elect have been chosen to have revelation, to receive revelation, been given the ability to have ears. This is why the scripture says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit has to say. When you have an ear to hear, it means God has favored you just as Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. Amen. And so when we have ears to hear what the spirit is saying, when we have that, uh, that revelation knowledge, when we can apprehend it, when we can comprehend it, when we can apply it, when we can function in it, that is a position of being the, um, being the, um, the chosen or the elected. And God said, Jesus said, even the elected could be fooled if it was possible. So I read a scripture last week that said that God will reveal all things in that were in secret, done that are secret. You know, secret society, dynamic, uh, d d uh, 
uh, demonic activity and all this kind of stuff. And I believe that's why we're getting even more uh, revelation about Daniel, revelation, uh, the, how the enemy functions and end time things and stuff like that. Because God is revealing it to his elected people. Amen. And praise be unto his name. And so we have to understand that these things, these strongholds, that's essentially what they are. These emotional, spiritual, spellbound strongholds have to be broken. That is an absolute must. A spell depends on how much emotion or energy you can generate and how intensely you can visualize your desired result. And I'm going to tell you what. I've been trained how to do this. They, this ain't what they called it. But this this is what they taught me essentially. to to Specifically how to raise money. To visualize what you want. Look at your crowd. Get them emotional. That ain't what they tell you. But they tell you to just... Just lead them into the spirit. So you, you, that's why people get up with cliches. And, and if the choir just jam, you ride that way for a while. I'm telling y'all, I'm going to mess y'all up going to conferences and revivals. But just pay attention to how people do stuff. This is what they do. And then people get all emotional. And then they tell you all about their materialism and tell you how they got what they got. And the last time they was at, uh, in a revival, just like this, very similar, how they begin to prophesy and they got letters saying that they that people uh hit the jackpot and people became uh got checks in the mail and and five thousand dollar increase and they gave 50 and all i mean they tell you all this stuff all that's tapping into your emotions when the last time you went to a church and they simply just said we want you to give as god has given on your heart to give here's what we're uh, trying to do here's the vision or whatever the case may be something to that effect we're raising money for asthma. We're raising money for cancer or something to that effect. Give as God has laid on your heart to give without any gimmicks. <laughs> you very rarely do. You know why? Because they have mastered the spell and they try to teach you the spell. But I believe God is calling people out from amongst this type of stuff because it's just it's just religion in first place. It doesn't bring glory to God. And God is breaking down to the simplest because that's what it was supposed to be. I knew we weren't going to get through this. A spell, so again, a spell depends on how much emotion or energy you can generate and how intensely you can visualize your desired result. Emotionalism drives the power of religion. I'm going to say that again. Emotionalism drives the power of religion why do you think you can go on youtube and you can look at um satan worship you can look at uh, uh um buddha worship you can look at uh the cow worship over in india you can look at the voodoo and all that kind of stuff and you basically if you turn off the um the sound you will see the same reactions and results that you find in church the difference is in church they might have on suits and in the voodoo they may have on a a, a grass skirt or no clothes at all or something to that effect but emotionalism drives the power of religion religion uh, lives off has to have as a battery emotionalism but that's not true for relationship relationship is driven by re revelation relationship is driven by revelation is not driven by emotionalism and even in your own relationships and marriages let me just help you out if you are trying to live in your marriage based off of emotionalism it's not going to last you have to have revelation functioning in your marriage i'm talking about 15 years you have to have revelation in your marriage to know each other to, to have relationship with each other that causes revelation and that's how you have a healthy marriage not emotionalism that's secondary <laughs> that shouldn't be the foundation praise be unto god so it feeds passion emotionalism feeds passion false hope Oh my God, I could stay right. I could do a whole hour just on false hope. I've done it before. Uh, emotionalism feeds passion, false hope, or false faith. Emotionalism feeds flesh. Emotionalism 
falsely assures people's desire to be or to be connected with a greater source from themselves. But it's still within themselves. That's what emotionalism is. So you get emotional and you blame God. And you say, see, God is with me because I got emotional. So you, we felt the power of God because I got emotional. Say yes. Say yes. Ah, yes. Emotionalism. <laughs> Not revelation. See, the truths of God ought to draw you to revelation knowledge. You ought to walk away knowing something more about God, not just an emotional high. It's no different than cocaine, baby. Because when you get high for cocaine, what is it going to do? It's going to make you want some more. So you go back to the source. That's emotionalism. Not saying that you might not lose it and want to give God praise. Not saying that. But I'm saying that when we are uh, focused on emotionalism and that's it. I have been told that I am a sorry preacher because I was, I'm a teacher and I didn't hoop. Or people got emotional in the midst of my sermon and I kept going instead of riding that emotionalism and, and taking them there. I've had preachers tell me, Doc, they shouted all night long. That's their goal, to preach, to get people emotional, to have an emotional reaction but not an experience with God. There's a major, 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 major difference between the two. And that's all we have time for tonight. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to see if the next moderator is on the line. Father, we thank you, and we praise you, and magnify you for your word. And Father, I pray that the truths of, of these truths and, and how Satan is a deceiver and how you are one that you came to give us life more abundantly and that you are all powerful and that the people of God will hear that the enemy has strategized even within the systems that we believe were of you. And Lord, give us the discernment to know the difference. And Lord, give us the revelation to know the difference. Open the eyes of our hearts that we might discern where you are because our desire is to be where you are and to be where you are alone, Father. We don't want the false stuff. We don't want the fake stuff. We don't want the stuff that we conjured up and that we created. Father, we want you. We want the realness. We want the power. We want the manifestation of you, God. And we pray, Father God, that you would reveal yourself to us. And Lord, that you would take us deeper into you. That you would expand our capacity for you. That you would pour more of you in us. That we would experience the grace, the revelation that comes from you and you alone, God. That we might be the men and women that you have elected to bring illumination and enlightenment of your kingdom and your, your, your purposes and your grace and your love to your people. Lord, that we might be a light set up on a hill to draw people out of darkness, not by our might, not by our power, but by your spirit. Tonight we say yes to you and we yield to you in every facet of our lives. Lord, I pray, Father God, for leaders who are struggling with pornography tonight. I pray, Father God, that you would give them the revelation to come out. I pray, Father God, for leaders who are led astray by emotionalism and lust, Father God. I pray that you will break its power and the source in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Father God, that you will open our minds and our hearts to your revelation, to your word, that we go deeper that we go deeper, that we go deeper, that we might know you, God, and not just of you, and not conger, conjure up a, a golden calf or ideal of you, and dance around it and parade and say, have we not been visited by the awesome power of God? But let us know that we have experienced you by experiencing what only you can bring about, your revelation, the manifestation of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Your word and clarity, a liberty to know you, Father, is what we desire more than anything. Lord, don't just bless our churches to grow, but bless us as the church, as your people to grow, to pray and seek after you. Hallelujah. To pray and seek after your presence and to be more like you and available and willing and yielded in the name of Jesus. 
Satan, you have no authority. We cancel every curse and assignment, every door, window that's been opened to you. We shut in and seal it with the blood of Jesus Christ. All your messages, everything that you've spoken, everything that you've uh, designed to dis discourage us, we eradicate it by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus.